Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be here with you to talk about uh, what it will be like to be a farmer in a world with robotics and AI. And two things about me that you should know as we go through this is, uh, number one, uh, I'm an American, as you can probably tell from my, my accent, but I've done agricultural research in about 60 countries uh, around the world. Uh, and I'm a farmer. Uh, I farmed full time uh, in the U.S. Midwest in uh, the 1970s, and I continue to be a partner in uh, maize and soybean farmer there. So this comes from a personal uh, perspective. And I have to admit, this is a topic on which I've had to uh, change my uh, mind. A few years ago, I wrote an article which ended with the, the, the phrase, farming without farmers. And it had a very uh, dark uh, perspective, at least from a farmer's perspective, of uh, farms on which all the decisions were made by artificial intelligence uh, and all the work was being done uh, by robots. But since coming uh, to the UK uh, and working with uh, the Hands Free Farm group at Harper Adams University, I've come to a, a bit of a different perspective. And I think that uh, robotics and AI offers farmers the opportunity to farm uh, with more time and energy for attention to the land and to the animals. Uh, and this is becoming an urgent issue because we're on the cusp of a major change, a, a change that will change agriculture as much as motorized mechanization did uh, in the early 20th century. So uh, if we look around the world, uh, already uh, a substantial number of cows in Europe are milked by robots. The milking robots were introduced in 1992 and they, uh, universe, um, industry sources tell us that by 2025, about 25% of cows in Northern Europe will be milked uh, by, by robots. Uh, cropping is not quite as far along, but uh, in France, which is the only country I know of that offers statistics on uh, farm robots, uh, there's about 100 robots being used now for weeding on vegetable and sugar beet uh, farms. Uh, in the United States, there's a company that has started market, marketing retrofit kits that take uh, conventional equipment and convert that for autonomous use. Uh, in the uh, artificial intelligence field, Probably the best example in agriculture is the use of AI in combine harvesters uh, to automatically adjust uh, equipment for better grain quality and efficiency to balance those two, two uh, objectives. And this has been available now for uh, several years on uh, large uh, combine harvesters. Uh, so uh, this is happening uh, as we speak. So, as we go through this, I'd like to propose four guidelines that will guide our thoughts. Number one, let's focus here on the UK because the way this works out will depend a lot on, on where you are. It may work out quite differently in America uh, or in Brazil than it does in the UK. Let's focus on technology in the pipeline, not technology that will be available sometime far in the distant future, but things that uh, companies right now uh, are developing and almost every major farm equipment company has a autonomous uh, equipment program. By our count, there's around 45 startup companies around the world that are focused on uh, agricultural robots. So this stuff is, is happening. Um, let's focus uh, on uh, food that your grandparents would have recognized. So food from plant and animal products. And I realize that uh, lab-grown meat and foods from single-celled organisms uh, will become more a part of our, our food chain in the future. But for now, let's, let's, let's assume that at least part of our diet in the future is gonna come from uh, plants and animals. And then lastly, let's assume uh, that the regulation and the legislation uh, will allow robotics and, and AI uh, to be used. So let's think about what the science says here. And there's been the most research uh, in dairy uh, because the milking robots have been around almost 40 years now. Uh, there's been quite a number of social science 
uh, studies in several countries, in the UK, in the US, in Australia, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Netherlands, Germany. And uh, interestingly, they all come out with quite similar uh, conclusions. Uh, and they've all been done mainly on fairly small and medium sized dairy farms, so 50 to 150 cows. Uh, and that occurred because milking robots have been a lifestyle choice rather than a profit enhancement choice. Uh, uh, large dairy companies, say the, the companies in the United States that maybe milk 10,000 cows, have only recently started installing dairy robots. Uh, be, and they've been started installing them because of concerns about supply of labor, uh, not the wage, you know. Can you even get somebody to milk cows if immigration is blocked? Okay, so they've started now, but that's very recent. Um, and most of the farmers in those studies report being quite satisfied uh, with their investment in uh, milking robots. And the main reason for that satisfaction is more flexibility in their labor schedule. So they're not tied to milking cows two or three times a day, seven days a week. They have more time for family. They have more time for community activities. And they report that their cows are also happier uh, and more productive. Uh, part of that comes from flexibility in the milking schedule because with robots, the cows can get milked when the cows want to be milked, not when uh, the human being is available to milk them. So some cows want to be milked twice a day and some cows uh, want to be milked three or four times a day and the robot can accommodate that without any problems. Uh, but also they're happier because there's less bullying. So cows are very social animals. There's a very distinct hierarchy in uh, herds. There's some dominant cows and then there's some cows that get picked on. And in a conventional system, when you group the cows for uh, milking, that was an occasion that the dominant cows could use to show their power. Now, if you no longer group them for milking, then that opportunity goes away and those uh, lower status cows are happier because they get dominated uh, less. Uh, so you have happier cows. Um, and farmers report that uh, it's easier for them to work with their cows. They spend, actually spend more time with the cows because now uh, they're not pressed to get the work done. They can actually spend some time observing the cows. Oh, this one uh, you know, maybe is uh, limping a little or whatever the problem is. And so uh, they can actually take more time to take care uh, of those cows. Crop robotics is not as far along, um, but uh, we do have at Harper Adams University, Hands Free Farm, which is one of the only places in the world where you actually have uh, experience with production of commercial crops entirely with uh, autonomous equipment. Uh, uh, Hands-free hectare started uh, in 2017 with one hectare, which was flat and square, uh, but which was farmed. We grew wheat and barley uh, on it. Uh, and this year, that's being ramped up to 35 hectares, which will be more like a real farm with multiple fields with different shapes and sizes and so on. Um, and the nice thing from an economist perspective is uh, that we have the data, number one, uh, and nobody else has that kind of data because uh, the farm equipment companies have uh, programs for research, but that's proprietary data. They don't release that. A lot of universities and research institutes uh, have Pro, the prototype robots, and they run them around on football pitches in parking lots, but they don't have experience actually producing crops. So at Harper Adams, we do. And these are retrofitted um, uh, conventional uh, equipment. Uh, and that's nice from the economics perspective because we know what that equipment costs. We know how reliable it is. We know what the repairs cost, the maintenance costs. We know the useful life. Uh, and so uh, we can, uh, we have most of the elements to compute the costs and returns. We put that into a standard uh, farm planning program and uh, looked at what 
uh, what that would look like for both a conventional and a, a robotic system. Behind you, uh, behind me, there are uh, cost curves for wheat production. And we picked wheat because there's lots of research on wheat and we can make easy comparisons. The blue line is a conventional uh, cost curve for wheat. Typical cost curve shape, uh, very high cost for very small farms. And we started out at about a 60 uh, hectare farm uh, all the way up to a 500 hectare farm. Uh, and then it, uh, costs go down for uh, larger farms. Uh, the numbers there uh, are the horsepower of the tractor for that equipment set. And in a conventional system, as you get a larger farm, you get a larger tractor. Uh, the orange line uh, is a cost curve for uh, a robotic farm. And there, the numbers uh, are the horsepower of uh, the tractor in that robotic equipment unit and the number of units, because on a robotic farm, using the swarm robotics uh, approach, uh, as the farm gets larger, you add uh, units uh, rather than getting larger and larger equipment. Now, there's three things you need to notice about these cost curves. One of them is that the robotic cost curve is substantially lower uh, than the conventional one, meaning you could produce wheat for lower cost, which in business is everything. If you can produce it at a lower cost, you're better off. Uh, uh, and that also has implications for trade because uh, trade usually moves from the low cost producer to the higher cost producer. That robotic cost curve is below the costs in most exporting countries around the world, Australia, Canada, Russia, Ukraine, and so on. So this means trade may well change, not only for wheat, but for lots of other things. Thirdly, maybe even more impo most importantly, is that the robotic cost, cost curve is slightly different shaped than the conventional one. It tends to flatten out uh, at a smaller farm size, so that at that 159 hectare uh, farm size, the second one over, uh, it's almost flattened out, meaning that you have the potential to achieve minimum costs at a smaller uh, farm size than you do with conventional equipment. Now the other chart, and this is the one that farmers, when I talk about this topic, are most interested in. And it shows the equipment investment for different farm sizes, both with conventional and robotic uh, farming. Uh, and for the, the two smallest farms, the costs are uh, about the same. They differ only by the cost of the guidance system and the software needed to convert from conventional uh, to robotic. But for the larger farm sizes, the investment for a robotic farm is much smaller because they're using small equipment more intensively. Uh, so for instance, for the largest farm, uh, the conventional uses a combine which new costs about 300,000 uh, pounds. The small, uh, the robotic farm uses three small combines which each cost 30,000 pounds. So a substantial savings in uh, the farm equipment investment, meaning that it would be possible uh, to, that's part of cutting costs, but it also means it would be possible to uh, enter into farming with a lower capital investment that would be the case with conventional farming. So uh, if we take uh, the research that's out there in dairy and in crop robotics, and you combine that with my roughly 40 uh, years of experience of a farmer, my vision of, of what it will be like to be a farmer with robotics and AI is that there's the opportunity for uh, many more smaller and medium farms producing a wider range of products because they have AI now to help them uh, sort through all the knowledge and expertise that's out there, uh, that uh, these farms will have more um, hedges and woodlands and wetlands and non-crop areas because the robots can farm around them without uh, reducing efficiency. They're farms that uh, use lower uh, levels of pesticide because with robots you have alternatives. In the weeding area you can mechanically weed or you can use lasers or electrics uh, to uh, zap the weeds. Uh, and so uh, you have less need for those uh, pesticides. You have the potential to farm better 
uh, in peri-urban areas. And from a North American perspective, almost all of the UK is a peri-urban area. Um, uh, but you can do that because you're using fewer pesticides, so fewer conflicts with your neighbors. And you're using smaller equipment, which is easier to move from field to field uh, without uh, dis disrupting traffic. You have a greater uh, potential to do traceability because you have sensors and AI to help you organize that information and offer consumers uh, that uh, possibility. Uh, and uh, over time, I think this will lead to lower government subsidies because these are farms that can be profitable on their own and uh, less government oversight because they have both the tools and the motivation to be good environmental managers. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me as I presented my uh, view of uh, what it will be like to be a farmer with robotics and AI.